Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Kirsten Dug. Kirsten, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I was going to say your company name, Embroidery by Kirsten Dug, but that seemed really redundant, so I didn't say that. <laughs> No, it's not really a company. It's really just a place for people to find me on the web. Okay, well, it works, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, yes. thanks for doing this. Okay, so anybody that goes to your site, uh, clearly you are fully connected with 17th century English techniques, embroidery, and so on and so forth. Um, what what is it that that draws you to that? What connects you to that? Because that that's can be rather complex, and it's uh, I mean it's beautiful stuff, but um, it's not for beginners. Well, no, I mean I think anyone can start anywhere. There's you know nothing to stop you. I certainly wasn't great when I started at it, but I started going to see museum pieces, and I realized that the way people put stitches together you know, 200, 500 years ago was a little bit different than what I saw in the books today because you have a limited number of pages in a book. And I became really interested in what wasn't being taught. Um, and there are a few people, of course, that teach it. But, you know, it's tough to put yourself into one definition. So, you know, I use that because it <laughs> had very few limitations to just kind of go back in time. But yeah, it was just the intricacy of it that drew me to it and all the kind of exciting ways to blend stitches together. Yeah, it's, it's amazing stuff. Is it, does it connect with your electrical engineer mind? Is that what it is? You know, I, I think it does a little bit in the okay. sense that I think a lot of people that do engineering just love to understand things and they like to reverse engineer them, right? You like to look at things and decide this is how someone else made this. It's you know exciting to figure out that puzzle. <laughs> yeah. And I find that when I look at these old pieces where I'm like, ooh, wait, you know, I think I know this stitch. I think, oh, but they put them together in this crazy way. And you know, that's sort of the heart of engineering, no matter what you're looking at. Right. It's the deconstruction and reconstruction that, you know, that makes it fascinating. Well, and then when you look at something and you're like, well, they did this, but, you know, I could also do something else, you know, in the, you know, in this way. So it kind of gets the wheels turning, right? And into even all the other exciting new things that you could do or a different thread or, you know, in putting right. two different stitches together. Right, right. Absolutely. So, okay, a little background. So how did you get started doing um, needlework? So I uh, first did needlework. I did canvas work or needlepoint, um, whichever name you want to use, uh, when I was a teenager. Um, there used to be this company, I think it was Sunset or something, that did all these Christmas ornaments. And they actually did cool Christmas ornaments and needlepoint ornaments. And they did incorporate all of these really awesome, cool stitches. And I grew up doing those with my mom. Um, but, you know, in... In kits, you only have a few very specific techniques and, you know, they're trying to sell to kind of the biggest group they possibly can. So by nature, you're, you tend to be a little bit limited. And so I then started, you know, kind of experimenting with other things. All right. So, so did your mom teach you how to do needlework then? Well, we just did it together. You know, we kind of both did these kits um, and she still does needle needlepoint today. And actually I have an aunt that does a lot of needlepoint too. So it was definitely a little bit of a family thing. It's always the mother and the aunt, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> or the grandmother, you know, it right. depends, right. but yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so did you, so you didn't do this all the way through school. You took a little break. Yeah, well, I kind of started investigating other things. I'm always a little bit curious. You know, I think today they call it the beginner's mind, you know, just constantly learning, you know, something new, something different, something you didn't understand before. And uh, so I, in fact, you know, a lot of times when I go travel, I just try to find out, all right, what craft do they do here? I want to take a class in it. Um, so, I, you know, I did, you know, the usual knitting and crochet. I did a lot of stained glass, actually. I did some woodworking. I did actually some metal work in engineering school because we had, you know, a metal shop. Um, you know, there's just so many things to build and make, right? right? But then in the end, you know, yeah, I came back to sort of the fiber arts, if you will. And I have done some sewing, of course, too. You know, it all sort of overlaps. And I would say that transition probably really started to happen with inspirations magazine uh -oh. you know when i discovered uh -oh. the <laughs> yeah when i discovered the australia magazine 
I was like, oh my gosh. And you know, they used to carry it at Barnes and Nobles and they don't anymore. You have to kind of know to look for it now. And um, I just thought, oh my gosh, there's things in here that I've, I've never seen. I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what this is, you know? And uh, yeah, I think that was the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, Inspirations is is a wonderful magazine, but very um, enabling um, for us <laughs> needleworkers. You want to try different techniques than to to learn different things. Oh, beautiful eye candy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I've ever done a project from them, but you know, got a stack of the magazines and how many of the books do we have? And uh, they're just fun to look at. But yeah, someday yes. I'll do a project. Uh, you should. That's just terrible. <laughs> I, know, I know. Well, it's not like I don't have a thousand others, so it's um, it's not not a matter of of need. It's just a matter of one more. Right. Uh, Very right. fair. Yeah. 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 So so the the electrical engineering uh, degree, and you get into the the world of uh, work and raising a family, and how do you fit the needlework in? Well, so, Barely. you know, you get, yeah, you get very busy. Um, but the, that's, that's actually one of the other reasons that I came back to the needle arts is that you can sit down and you can do that for 15 minutes. Okay. It's not our preference, but you can just sit down. Like I have a minute, I have a moment. It's the same with knitting. You know, I used to bring my knitting around with me. I would just keep it with my stuff. And then if you find yourself waiting, instead of getting on the phone and like watching, you know, whatever mindless thing, an app you're gonna use, take out your knitting, take out your embroidery. And then all of a sudden you find like, wow, I've just finished this project in time that didn't even, you know, would have otherwise been totally lost. You know, I find the same thing even in front of the television you know, okay, you're looking up, you're looking away from it. Are you doing it a little bit slower? Certainly, but do you have all of these little moments in the day that you can actually recuperate? And I just started doing it. Right. I, I always am amazed by people who will say, well, I, I can't, I don't have time to do needlework. And I, I want to say, okay, so do you, you play those games on your phone? You know, you watch TV, <laughs> you know, and you can, you can, you can use that time and you have something at the end. That's what I like is that I have a, when I'm at the end of a day, I can say, okay, I put this many stitches in or I look, I've made something with my time. I don't know. I mean, absolutely. And, and the thing is now actually I've switched to using audible a lot, or even, you know, you can get audible books, of course, at your library. Um, and I listen to things, you know, instead of sitting down and reading a book, I listen to something and I do stitching and I always make sure that I have a couple stitching projects one that I have already worked out and I know I just have to do it. And one that, okay, I need to turn everything off. I need two hours. I need to define what's happening in this space. Um, and I always leave a full length of thread threaded and ready to go. So I don't actually stop when I finish a spot. I finish a spot and then I start the next spot and I leave it there so that when I sit down, you know exactly what you're doing for that first couple of minutes. And by the time you make it through that couple of minutes, you get rolling because a lot of people, I think even myself get overwhelmed with, oh, when I sit down, like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, or I'm not, you know, I've got to get started. I've got to get rolling. So leave yourself halfway down the hill. <laughs> so you just roll. Right. Yeah. That was a, uh, somebody told me that a long time ago. It's a trick I use every time. Yep. Get started on the next thing before you walk away. And then you, you, mm -hmm. it's excellent. Cause yeah, you just sit down and go and you're underway. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Having those needles threaded and ready to go, there's there's something about it. Then you can just sit down, even if you only have five, 10 minutes, you you know, you can get something done. It it does, it's rewarding. Yeah. And then, you know, I did end up leaving engineering um after I had two children. I just said, All right, this is too much division. Um, I wanted to spend <laughs> more time with my kids. I wanted to live a healthier lifestyle. I wanted a healthier home life for the whole family. And, you know, two parents with two super aggressive jobs, you know, it just didn't have a calm, calm it didn't leave a calmness. And I was traveling quite a bit too um, at certain parts of my job. And while I did love engineering, it really, in the end, wasn't where, where my heart really sat. I wanted to keep learning, you know, and growing and learning new things. And I just decided, all right, this is the transition for me. And so I, you know, stayed home and my second was born and then I went ahead and had a third. So, you know, that kept me quite busy. Um, 
having three kids, but they're all a bit older now. Um, my, I have one in high school and my youngest is in fourth grade. So, you know, they still require a lot of my attention, but I'm finding I have a lot more free time. And it's been in these last, you know, five, eight years that I've had more and more, more and more time for the embroidery. And that's, of course, when I find, found um, Thistle Threads and I found the Royal School of Needlework. In fact, the Royal School of Needlework, the first summer I went, was a birthday present to me. You know, my, my family asked me, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, I want someone to take our children so that I can go take one of the intensives over the summer at the RSN. Wow. What Holy a birthday smokes. present. Yeah, I'll say, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was kind of a big birthday. But uh, but yeah, so my mom took the kids and, uh, you know, everyone's kind of supported me to, to make it happen. And, you know, I started their certificate program. And that turned into an annual event for me. I'm not quite sure how that happened. I mean, I guess I just have amazing people that love me. Um, but now, this year, I actually just went this last summer to wait do minute, the wait last. Minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Ba back Go up ahead. the truck here. So you got, the <laughs> you got the birthday present and you worked that into an annual trip to England to study Absolutely. at the Royal School? <laughs> well played. Well played. Jealous. Yeah. Jealous. I was I'm a very, very lucky woman. Very, very blessed. And, um, and I thought, you know, that first summer I went, I thought, okay, maybe I'll make it back one more time. So I actually did the classes a little bit out of order because I thought, oh, I need to prioritize what I really want to do. Um, but in the end, you know, like I said, I, you know, just did the last class for their, um, diploma program. So the, instead of, I finished the certificate, I went on to the diploma. This was my, this summer was my last class, but I haven't turned it in yet. But, you know, I remember getting on the airplane that first time and it was the first time I actually had been alone in a really like many years. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, I mean, mothers will understand this, right? Yes. I mean, right, seriously, right. like even the private time things you should be doing alone, you don't really get to do alone when you have small children. So, right. so I got on the airplane and I think I started to giggle like, like I was insane. Cause I thought, Oh my gosh. And I realized that, and this is, you know, kind of a, again, a shout out to, to new moms, you know, you sometimes do need a little bit of that personal space and it's okay to ask for it because it was so refreshing to be able to do something undisturbed. And while I appreciate grabbing all of those little bits of time to make something like we talked about earlier, being able to sit down and concentrate about one thing for two weeks was incredibly eye-opening. I mean, it just, it blows everything wide open how much you can all of a sudden like, really do and grow and accomplish, particularly with, you know, the kind of resources that the Royal School helps you out with. So you come back from that first trip, you're a whole new woman. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that, you know, it just shoots you off into that space, right? right. You're, you're ready to go. You're like, all right, what's next? <laughs> like, right. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And, and <laughs> I was always pushing with them. I mean, you know, I, there, they have a very great system at the Royal School of Needlework, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to push back. And, uh, in the end, it just, it was such a great partnership for me. I mean, maybe, maybe not quite a partnership is the right word, but you know, it just, the way they would just kind of take all of my questions in and the tutors would just work around, you know, what made me as an individual different from other students you know, they're really wonderful at working with all kinds of different people. I mean, that's one of the amazing things about their tutors. So, so it wasn't intimidating at all. They just took you in and off you went. Yeah. I mean, you, they make you start with Jacobean, which is great because, you know, wool work, you know, it goes, can go a little bit faster. You know, it's a bigger thread. Um, it's defined, but it's very whimsical you know, there's so many fun stitches to do with Jacobean and so many cool ways to do them. And they've got this great big old panel in the room with you that has all these amazing stitches put together. Like I was saying before, you know, it's an older piece. And so you can look at that for inspiration. You know, you get to kind of design your own piece. So it's a wonderful way to start. And it's predominantly with other new people because they make everybody take that class first. Yeah. And it's a class that not everybody is even a stitcher when they show up. You get a lot of people that are in kind of, you know, other arts that decide, oh, I want to try embroidery and they, you know, do a program for that. And it's, you know, so it's, it's, I do not find it intimidating, but you have to go being prepared to work. I mean, it is 
two weeks of high intensity. Like don't plan on, you know, going and touring London while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we've, we've said that with other uh, people who have graduated from the Royal school, when you get done, you know, quite clearly whether you love or hate needlework because of the intensity. Well, and that's if you do the whole program, of course, you yeah. know, starting one class is, you know, that's just, you know, that's just for fun. But yeah, I mean, but I, and I do think I have to say, I've met a lot of people at this point because I've only ever done one, one class at a time, but you do get people that try to do all four of their certificate programs, classes all in one summer. Don't do it. <laughs> just don't do it. <laughs> I mean, the, and because e everybody gets to like, the, they maybe make it through the first then the second they don't finish, then they then they skip the third, and then maybe they go back for the fourth. And then you see them the next summer. I love it. Like so many of them, like I saw the first summer when they started, and then I see them back the next summer. I'm like, yeah. oh. Well, um, I mean, I'm sure there are people that manage it in, in a summer, but it's few and far between, I have to say, yeah. for good reason. So right. you were at Hampton Court. Did you get a, a hotel room, a, a rent an apartment? How did you... What, how did you work that all out? Because you, you, when you do this, I, I assume that the stitching isn't just while you're in class. There's stitching pretty much all day. Absolutely. And, and you have at least one day that you can't go in because the whole Hampton Court is closed on Sundays. So on the days that you don't have tutors, you know, you can go in and stitch there if you want. But um, you really need to be able to stitch in the evenings also. So I usually bring a lit magnifier with me just to give me some options like on a clip. And, you know, then you everyone gets a little bit creative about how they rig up a way to hold their slate frame, you know, with desks and books and other things. <laughs> you know, it, it usually works out, although they will they will actually let you borrow trestles if you want to trek them around. But I find that, well, they, I think they do sometimes provide a list of people that you can house with. I did that for quite a few years in a row. Um, or you just go on an Airbnb or a booking.com and you just rent an apartment. And, you know, there actually are some pretty reasonable ones. Um, and then, then it, you know, depending on availability this last year, I mean, COVID made things a little bit interesting. Um, I have spent some days in, in uh, a hotel. But, you know, there's lots of options around there for sure. But I, I always pick my place by how close is it. You know, I want to be able to walk, right? You don't want to spend a lot of time on tra public transportation and being, you know, stuck on, you know, those buses. <laughs> right, right, right. So did you incorporate when you were then in London um, going into, I mean, at Hampton Court going into London while you were there? Did you extend your two-week stay so you could go to the VNA? Um, so what I found that I do, cause I do tend to stitch about 10 hours a day when I'm there, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and then I take one full day off in the middle. So, and then in that day, I usually go into the city. I go see a show, you know, I do something in the West end. I go to the VNA and I used to go to the cloth workers center from the VNA. And it's actually where I've seen some of the most amazing pieces. But of course, that has been closed because it's being moved um, out of the city. But it used to be in London in a big building that's, I think, becoming apartments now. And it's all the collections for the VNA. So you could request to see things that aren't otherwise on display. Because the VNA, you know, I think they have one casket on display, but, you know, they own, you know, tens, you know, I don't know, who knows how many. Um, and I think I've seen about 20 of them. Uh, and it's eye opening if you want to see 17th century embroidery. And then I've also had some of the older pieces taken out for me that are ecclesiastical pieces, which have the most amazing or new work and, you know, other silk work that just, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to even process when you see it. And it's, you know, it's really invigorating because you're like, oh my, you know, you're feeling pretty good about yourself, right? You're working at the RSN, you're, you know, you're doing all these classes and then you go and you look at these pieces and you're like, oh my gosh, I have so much to learn. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so you, did you just, did you set that up beforehand? You know, you knew you were going to take a Wednesday, so you contacted them before you left the United yes. States? Yes, 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, I, you know, I haven't done it in the last year, um, two years, I guess. But uh, I imagine when they reopen, you know, if you go to the VNA or you look up Cloth Workers Center, uh, there is just an email address that you can just request. And, you know, there are certain things that they won't move. But my experience, and you can only see six pieces, you know, and usually what I do is I actually go on to um, the Thistle, like the last couple of times I did it, I went on to the Thistle Threads blogs and I said, hey, who's in London and wants to go see embroideries? <laughs> you know, there's a great <laughs> right. embroidery community, right? So you're like, hey, if they're going to haul these things out, like let's have, you know, a small group and get the most out of it. Um, and so that's actually a lot of fun because then you meet people that you've otherwise never seen face to face. Um when they take right. those pieces out uh, for a, a private viewing uh, or whatever you you call it, what, what's that like? I mean, is it is it white gloves? Are you, are you being watched at every second by someone from the museum? So they bring them out onto these tables in a well lit area, and um, you know there's a curator. And in the case of the caskets, of course, lots of times you want to see the inside, and so in those cases they will open them for you. You're not, of course, allowed to touch them. But what I will say is that because they have a learning charter at the VNA, I mean, one of their main charters is to help people use what's been made before to make new things, you know, to, to really encourage future art. Mm -hmm. um, they will let you take absolutely as many photographs as you want. Oh, um, wow. so they just have a lot of rules about how you hold cameras or wearing glasses or anything that could possibly drop onto things, you know, so they're very particular <laughs> about that, which fair right. enough, you know, they've seen it. Um, you know, so they protect the pieces, you know, quite well. Um, you know, there, I remember there's a casket that they won't take out anymore because it has spangles on it and moving it is dangerous. So, you know, you have to be mindful of what the pieces are. But uh, they're, you know, they want you to see them. And of course, now they're photographing more of the collection. But, you know, nothing really replaces seeing it, you know, right there in front of you. And then, of course, even with a cell phone camera now, you can get, you know, essentially close up photos that you really can reverse engineer the stitches. You really can see what's happening and you can see the threads. You know, now we have this challenge of how do we get the historic threads or what, do, you know, what the, should they even look like? Because a lot of what's being used on those pieces is a mixture of silk and metal, right? And they're, you know, made mm -hmm. in all these interesting ways. So um, it's great to see that, you know, you realize, wow, I mean, this is, I, I want to find this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's, and that's the fun thing about Thistle Threads is that she's got, Trisha's got so many threads coming out to use. So do you have a, when you, did you order a, just the casket or are you taking Trisha Nguyen's classes, one of her classes? Yeah. So I, you know, so I started with her, not at the beginning, but when she was still doing, you know, still doing the full casket classes. But at the time I was really just interested in needle lace. So I actually took the second class first, <laughs> which was really the mirror. And it was just all about needle lace. I was like, all right, I want, I want to learn needle lace. And so um, I did that, and then I realized, wow, these caskets are just amazing. Like, how do I not just fully jump into this rabbit hole? And it is exactly a rabbit hole. It is deep and it is dark. <laughs> um, but, yes. But when you go down it, I mean, you just, they're just constantly at every turn, like, oh my gosh, oh my God, no, oh wait, oh, you know, <laughs> like, I wanna try that, I wanna do this. Um, and so, yes, I bought a casket and then I went back, I took the first class um, and I own two caskets. <laughs> I have um, one is a regular flat top casket. The other one is a big flat top casket. So it, you know, has the doors and all the secret stuff and everything else. And I have almost finished actually silk with silk and paper. And I don't know if, you know, she also is, you, and I saw this on a lot of caskets at the Cloth Worker Center. They where they take cards, and Trisha teaches this, where you, and you take flat silk and you wrap horizontally and vertically to create patterns. Um, it's actually super cool. And she sort of has hop hypothesized that maybe when some of the girls couldn't quite make it through the end of all the embroidery of the caskets, that's how they finished some of them, because it was faster. <laughs> yes. um, no, I mean, but, but it's actually really tricky. I mean, it's simple in theory. It's one of those things that you look at and you're like, yeah, sure, no problem. But like most things in life, it's all in the details, like trying to hold it, trying to keep your threads taut, you know, to get the, you know, to get it right. But 
I did my drawer fronts in that technique inside my casket and they just, they are so cool. They turned out just amazing. Um, and, and then I, I'm designing my own casket because that was really the original point of the class. So she teaches a class now that you can stitch her design, um, which is great. I think a lot of people really want that, but the original, you know, program that she taught was really to give people the opportunity to make it yours. Right. Um, and so I've been doing just that and I have finished the four outside panels and I'm working on the top. So I'm like, I see the light. So the deep, dark hole, like all of a sudden, like I see the bright light at the end and it's, it's very exciting. So I, I think I'm going to get a finish in pretty soon. And then, and then maybe I'll start the second one. <laughs> all right. That's, that's exciting that you, so that first class really is more of a, to teach, she, she doesn't give you the pattern you're designing your own that's interesting because I, I i have her second class and i of course it's sitting waiting for me because it makes me incredibly nervous to even think about it um, but those threads are calling me and i look i just i need to get that out i need to work on it well so do you have the second class with the mirror the no oh no, no. okay no All it's right. uh simple harmony i think it's the name of the casket Yes. Yeah. So, so there were, you know, now she doesn't sell just the, I think maybe she doesn't sell the, just the plain caskets anymore because, you know, she had someone special making them. There was sort of, and he kind of said, Oh, I'm only going to make this many. So, you know, it kind of ran out. Although I think if you look on the resale market and even to contact her, you know, she's trying to help people that have caskets that, and to get them to people that want them. But yeah, the original class was really to make your own, the original too. But what I will say is the way she did it is she had a lot of small projects in it. And I think she still, and, and it used to have all the materials to do all the smalls. Um, so, it, I mean, I, I loved the way she designed it because it really, it, it was great for if you realize at the end, like, oh, I just don't have it in me to do a casket. Um, you got to learn all the techniques and have a lot of fun. But yeah, I mean, just pick up that first panel and just start it because the threads are so much fun to work with. And then of course she does these frostings boxes. So she does these limited thread releases. Um, so for those of us that are just <clears throat> want to play and design and, you know, that got me, that looped me back to the Royal school of needlework because I did an advanced gold work, you know, piece for them for my, you know, certificate diploma. And they say, all right, in advanced gold work, you can, you can use color. And so most people do some long and short stitching to add some color to some flowers in with all the gold work technique. But I was like, well, I have these gold work threads, you know, that you would normally think of that were just doing like plate, but they're all wrapped in silk. And of course, all this stuff is from Trisha. So <laughs> I'm just like, and I have, I have, you know, I have pearl, 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 that's actually wrapped in silk. So, I mean, it is gold work. It's the same technique. And you said I could use color <laughs> and I, I got, I mean, I can just see their eyes roll, right? Like, of course you do. Like, why? Like, <laughs> where did you come from? And I just thought, I, just, I wonder, I wonder, you know, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> but uh, yeah. And at this point I was working on this piece during lockdown. So I was actually doing it one-on-one -on -one with a tutor. And so she was going back and, you know, I was getting permission for everything. And, and she, I mean, she just laughed. She just laughed. It was great. Um, so it, it, you know, there's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. The, the threads, you know, from the kit are, are fantastic. And, um, and I did, I did, um, EGA's more than a rose group correspondence course with my guild. And cause I wanted to try the needle lace on something small. Um, that, yes. that was my greatest fear using, um, which is a gilt silk twist. Yes. Get that, right. oh, that stuff is wonderful i yes i need every single color i just it is lovely to to do the needle lace with i was it, I, it's, it's a so lot of fun. fun and actually you know at first it feels a little tricky but you find that the rigidity of having that metal piece in it really actually gives you a structure um and i would say for anyone that really wants to start out needle needle lace the other thing is do a corded buttonhole you know i think you know it's like a corded either, some people call it a brussels stitch but uh, having that cord also keeps everything kind of in place and mm -hmm. it's a good place to practice. 
But right. the other thing I have to say for needle lace, which I just, I love it. There's so many options for cool things to do with it between the threads, between leaving gaps, you know, doing an up down. I mean, there's just so many ways. And that's what you see in the antique pieces is that my first needle lace, it was horrific. I mean, it was awful. It was just like, you know, keeping the tension even is just so difficult. Um, and I did this, I have to tell people, because this is one of the inspirations projects, this little heart scissors fob that was done by Catherine Barley. Um, and it's, I actually have the Inspirations magazine here. It was an Inspirations 86, okay? And it's this tiny little scissors fob and you're like, sure, no problem. It was the most awkward, you know, strawberry you've ever seen. But you know what? I loved it because it just showed like, hey, I still did this. Like I made a strawberry. It might not have looked like Catherine's strawberry, but it's a strawberry. <laughs> and, you know, just keep going. I mean, one of the things that you learn in business and engineering is that it's okay to fail. Just fail fast. And in some cases, fail frequently because you will learn so much. All of a sudden, you'll get to a piece and you'll be like, wow, I got it. Like, I can do this. And you know what? The old stuff, you're still going to love it. I mean, I did a mirror from Thistle Threads and it was all this embroidery and around it. And I actually didn't do it exactly the way she did it. So I had a lot of needle lace on it. And I just worked around. I didn't go like around it, you know, starting from one corner and doing it in a circle. I moved around so that the good sections of my needle lace mixed with the bad sections of my needle lace. And they were all just kind of different. I mean, and again, it was like engineering. It's like, that's not an error. That's a feature. You know, <laughs> just say differently. Right, right, right. You know, right. user, you know, creator's choice. Right. And don't be afraid. Just go for it. <laughs> All right, now more pressure to get that casket going. More yeah. pressure. <laughs> well, and, and I was going to ask because because Beth's casket, she has a, a, a mental image of of a theme that she wants to do. The one that you're doing, where you're creating your own, is, is there a theme to it? Yeah. So I sort of. If, when I, yeah, it was, yeah, sort of. <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, you just want something you like, right? But it's fun to get introspective about it. So. I decided that I wanted a lot of whimsical flowers that weren't really recognizable, which I took a lot of the line drawings from Trisha, you know, from the old caskets, because you see a lot of these repeated patterns. And so I took a lot of those and I took a lot of the animals and I picked specific animals that had fun characteristics. You know, I mean, if I was going to try to think about myself, I realized I'm not one thing, you know, none of us really want to be one thing. You know, I want to be a mother. I want to be an artist. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a wife. I want to be a sister. You know, I mean, I want to do all these things. I have all these pieces. I have all these parts of my personality. And so I wanted the casket to look a little bit like that. So actually on my website, you'll see, I think I have at least one or two of my finished um, panels. And um, one of them has a panther. So that one's strength. You know, I have, um, a, you know, just sort of a, an owl on one panel for wisdom, you know, a, a deer for grace. I actually have a unicorn on it so that we don't forget that we, you know, want to be imaginative creatures. Uh, and so that's, that's been a lot of fun to do that. And then of course the flowers, since they're not specific flowers, you can, you can stitch them any way you want, any color you want. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, but my second casket, you know, I did that first casket because I was like, Oh, I don't know about the people. I don't know about the faces. Um, but one of the classes for the Royal School of Needlework I did was actually stump work. And they require you to do a person. And this was why I actually bought a second casket was because I thought, well, if I'm going to do this huge piece for the RSN, <clears throat> I might as well just make it a casket panel. But my other casket's already designed, so I'll just have to buy a second <laughs> casket. Oh, that makes I love sense. the I love the justification. I love the absolutely. Justification. Well, you know, we we uh, embroiderers, I think in general, get very good at justifying, specifically adding to our stash. But that's a right. different issue. Right. So, so for that one, I actually decided to do. I, I had a storybook that was an Art Nouveau um, illustrated version of um, the Lady and the Lion or some people call it the singing lark, but it's actually an extended version of Beauty and the Beast. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the illustrator off the top of my head, but it was just a really fun version of it. And so I looked at some of those and I drew um, a panel that had the lion and it had you know, the young woman and she, on her finger, she had the, the little lark. And 
that's what I did for the RSM piece. And they were really great about it because I said, hey, I don't want to mount this because I have to glue it to a box. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, if you make me mount it, which is part of it, then I'm just going to cut it all off and so that I can paper it to put to this box. And so they're really cool about it and they let me finish it. But I discovered that you can make amazing people. They have a great technique for doing faces. Um, and so now I'm actually really excited about the second casket to do it in a more traditional sense. And of course, the whole casket will be based on the fairy tale. Um, but yeah, now with people. So one of the other things that I guess this goes back to is that don't be afraid to try something that you don't think you're going to like. Um, and the RSN has made me do that because it's a program. So each, you know, each class is generally a different technique. You know, there are a few advanced versions. But some of the techniques that I thought, I don't like that, that's not my style. Because you get to choose and design your own piece, you get to figure out how to make it your style. You know, and the tutors are there to help you do that, you know, to help you make it work into what you want to be making and what you want to do. Um, and my biggest example of that was actually doing applique. You know, it's not really you know, kind of 17th century, but there are so many places it turns out that you can add in applique, particularly if you want to do a larger project. And then of course you learn about all these amazing fabrics and amazing trims. And you're like, oh wait, this is really useful. And I loved that piece in the end. Actually, it's on my website too. It's the Peacock. So. Yeah, that's a beautiful piece. Yeah. I didn't even realize yeah. that was applique uh, till you really start to study it. Yeah. That, that came out very well. That's beautiful. And I actually have to do a shout out to um, uh, the French Needle. Yes, the French Needle. They have packets of um, uh, already small pieces of silks. So, and, the, and they're in these color packs. So for that piece, I actually just bought from them, you know, sets of like six different colors of small design silks. And uh, they, I mean, they're just beautiful, you know, and, and you have so many of them. So it's perfect for things like applique. And they have some velvets too, actually, that are quite nice. Yeah, keep going, Kirsten, because see what's <laughs> happening on this end is you're costing Beth an awful lot of money. <laughs> That's right. You, yeah. you don't know, I, 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 I'm taking little notes here. This yeah. is terribly bad. Yeah, terribly I'm, I'm bad. just enjoying <laughs> listening because, yeah, it's getting really expensive for Beth right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the funny thing is when you find all those amazing materials, they, you know, they excite you and they like send you in all these interesting directions. You're like, Ooh, what can I do with this? What can I do with that? And that's, you know, that, and again, I have to go back to the RSN because it's one of the few places that will help you transition to make your own pieces. So it's, I love doing other people's projects. You know, it's great. You learn a lot from doing them, but at some point, most of us really want to transition into making something that really is what we're doing, right? Like what, you know, it's, right. is personally ours. And that doesn't mean starting with a blank sheet of paper. I mean, for my, for my needlepoint piece at the RSN this last summer, I picked a tile from William de Morgan circa 1900 as an inspiration, right? Now, does my embroidery have anything to do with a ceramic tile? No, of course not. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm designing all kinds of things, but I started with this image, you know, that made sense to me. And that, you know, that peacock was based off of a um, uh, mosaic in Leeton House, you know, in London, you know, also done at the same, you know, an Art Nouveau time period piece. So, I mean, you, you pull all these things and then you pull all the threads and you're like, ooh, how can I put them all together? You know, and, but it's all about the materials. So I think if you're gonna do your own things, you do, you know, you kind of have to create that stash, you know, cause you have to be able to pull from it when you're inspired. D did you write that down, Beth? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Justification for my stash. Yeah, I, heard right. I heard it. Okay. I heard I'm it. Okay. I'm just covering and, your, and, I'm just covering you, Beth. You know? <laughs> thanks. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm justifying. I'm, I'm helping. I'm helping. Um, and then of course all these techniques overlap, right? I mean, for the applique piece, they were like, all right, you have, you have to make a certain amount of cords, you know? And I was like, oh, cords. All right. We all know how to make twisted cords. Fine. You know, that's no big deal. But I was like, but what other kind of cords can we make? I mean, there are a lot of braids out there. Well, it turns out that there's a woman, uh, and I wish I could remember, uh, I'm not going to remember this one. Um, that did a book that was all about old finger loop braiding from, you know, 
you know, I don't know, I mean, 500 years ago. I mean, it was in old English. I mean, it was actually, I tried to read the original text and you can't understand it. I mean, it's supposed to be in English, but I would say it's even worse than Chaucer, right? <laughs> but it, you do, you do all these loops and you can make all these crazy braids. And so I did a bunch of those in my applique piece too. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can use these anywhere. I mean, that can go on anything. I mean, it, you know, it's, it just all overlaps. Yep. Mix it all together. <laughs> you know, in, here in the States, we're so programmed to buy someone's design and execute it. And uh, particularly in Europe, but I think most of the world, uh, you're, you're more programmed to create your own. And when, when you went to the school and, and you've done now the, the classes and you have the diploma, what is, what's your um, technical hand embroidery? Is that the one you have? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, how did that how did that play in your mind uh, in terms of switching over and saying, uh, create my own? You know, that's the leap that the RSN helps you take. Right. Because each when you take you, of course, you can take all kinds of classes there. They take they do do traditional project classes to just try something out. So anyone should you know try a day class. But for, you know, for that certificate diploma program, they do not have you know, a specific piece that you do. You have to come in with an idea. You just have to show certain techniques in it. So it really does push you over the edge, right? You don't have a choice. But again, you can pull from all kinds of inspirational pieces and the tutors are there to help you do that. So I think that one of the most amazing things about that class is not that they teach you how to perform certain stitches properly or work with different metal threads. It is that they teach you to make something that is yours. And I wish we had more of that here, but it is a very difficult, hard, you know, class to teach. So, you know, I uh, do understand why the guilds don't do a lot of classes like that, but I really do wish we had more of it here because in the end of the day, we're trying to create artists, you know, I mean, and yes, it's great to try other people's work, but you should always be trying to do something that's unique and individual to you and isn't just changing a few thread colors, right? Right. right. What is it? I guess, and I didn't ask the question right. Was it, was it freeing in your mind, uh, freeing you up, uh, and did it bring out creativity you didn't realize you had? Absolutely, and I think it went along with seeing a lot of the old pieces, right? I mean, you want to see a lot of really advanced work, you know. Actually, well, and that well, and of course, we haven't talked about Jenny, Aiden, Christie, but if you want to <laughs> see them, I mean. You know, right. kits, I buy her kits, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, because she's doing those advanced techniques and she's putting all those amazing historic threads together. But there aren't a lot of people like that, like her out there. So, you know, if you want to be trying it, you need to look, you know, look at projects like her, look at antique work, you know, maybe, maybe get together with an RSN tutor in some form or, or an old RSN teacher that, that now teaches, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people like that. Um, well, like you had talked to Sarah Jane Dennis, you know, she's working on her own now, you know, in uh, more to the north. And, you know, you find those people, they know how to help you. Well, actually, even Jenny, like, ha you know, has an open studio that I think you can go in. She, I think she helps with a lot of casket panels. <laughs> she has a lot of thistle threads people that are like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, do this whatever piece. But it's amazingly freeing when you finally get over that and then you make something and you're like well this is this is uniquely mine you know this isn't just like changes to someone else this is this only exists because of all of these pieces that I put together um but you have to you know I I take pictures of certain techniques that I like you know and and when I started my casket I I'm a little old school right I started printing things pictures from old caskets printers from books you know, mosaics, you know, Art Nouveau things, whatever. And I started printing them and I had a wall that made me look like a mass murderer. You know, I mean, it, it would like had tape everywhere. And then like, I'd have a technique stuck to a picture of a, you know, an animal or a flower or, you know, I mean, <laughs> it did it. They were arrows and strings, you know, because it, you know, some of those big projects too, you know, you really are trying to like pull in so much information. It is a little bit hard to keep it straight, but that's what that's what's going to make you not sit at that blank page and just be overwhelmed. Well, that, and that's, that's very helpful. Yeah, that's that kind of the neat thing is is you you almost develop another stash of ideas. 
Absolutely. I mean, and, and don't be afraid to print them. I mean, <laughs> honestly, because it, and you know, you keep books, you keep journals and I am not good at sketching. It's, you know, you, I, I know sometimes you see these sketches of like people that do, you know, fashion design and you're like, yeah, that is not what my, that's <laughs> not what my prep work looks like. <laughs> it's right. not nearly that elegant. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, don't be afraid of what it looks like. Just, you know, stick it all there, shove it all in, in some form, you know? I love that. The yeah. mass murderer wall. Look out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's well. And then, of course, now, you know, now I have I have a lot of I use a lot of Overa swath threads on spools and uh, which is great because I buy the spool racks on the walls. And of course, the gilt silk twist comes on spools, too, and a lot of the gold work. So I just have like racks and racks and racks of spools. But that's great, too, because you just look and then you just go there. I have a box. I start pulling threads you know, I put them in my box and then I go and I try out. And then if I don't want to, you know, I go back, but it's nice to have your materials in a way that's easy to see them, you know, and, and easy to pull from them and, you know, kind of consider, well, what might work well together? You know, it's nice. You want, you want everything to really be in front of you and accessible. So, so I, you have the design wall, but you, do you also keep like a journal where you take like snippets of your threads or your fabrics and put them in the journal and put notes in there too? Or is it just all on your mur mass murder wall? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, um, I do from the, from the RSN. Yeah, no, no. I mean, seriously. So I do from the RSN, I keep a lot of notes, uh, you know, on my design page, right? So, you know, I have a black and white drawing for, for whatever I'm working on and, you know, they just a line drawing and I always write in there, you know, what, you know, what I'm doing, but for like my gold work piece for the RSN and they didn't really ask for this. I also did have then a strip of each of the different, um, threads I used because I used, you know, some different types of things and different colors. Um, you know, if it's just colors, then I don't usually put samples in, but if it's kind of odd threads that might sort of become obscure or, or already obscure, then I like to put a little piece in or like with that, with the applique piece, when I did all the finger braiding, I named the braids and where I found them and put little snippets of the braids so that if I ever wanted to go back and try to figure out how the heck did I do that? Because it's not like I've memorized them all. Some of them were quite complicated. <laughs> you know, I have that reference to go back and then I put all those things together with the project. So I have a, a binder, you know, with the plastic sleeves and I just put everything in for like those big projects so that, you know, I can kind of reverse engineer my own work if need be. <laughs> right. The uh, uh, EGA Master Craftsman program, that uh, uh, rather intense too? Yeah, so that's kind of a fun one. It's a little different in the sense that they're really testing you it's not a teaching program. It's really a, let's, let's see if you're good at this. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and the wool, the wool one was fun. I think it's six pieces. Um, you know, it starts out simpler and then you, and they give you like a project. So some of them are like, all right, we want you to do a Williamsburg style, you know, blue and white design. And they'll give you a, a line drawing and say, all right, show us that you know what this technique is and what the history is. And, you, and you're allowed to do the research and stuff for it. Right. Um, and you submit them. But the fun part about that one is that, you know, and I just did it because I just thought, well, I want to check out what this is. You know, I didn't know. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to start submitting things and see how it goes. But you can only submit once every six months. So it takes three years, even if you do everything perfectly, which, you know, most most of the time you they send a few things back. But the last piece is a all right, show us what you got. Right. Like, give us something unique. And that was actually one of the first times that I had done something completely on my own. And at the time, my sister, who's amazingly supportive of me um, and lives out in Stockholm, she was like, hey, I saw this really cool embroidered chair. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not embroidering you a chair. And she's like, well, just think about it. Well, I, and, and she had done this a couple of years before. And so when I got to this final piece, I'm like, I'm going to embroider a chair. Like, why not? And so I took all of the dollar art like designs. They have some like, um, you know, for like the, kind of when you see the, the horses and things, there's this very, I think it's Kerbet's, this very specific Swedish style. And so she sent me some kids coloring books in this style. And I started pulling from those. 
and she found this really cool barrel back chair and I designed this crazy Swedish, you know, flower spray on the back with applique leather and all wool work. And I had a blast. It was a lot of fun, but I think the EGA was like, and, and of course it, I sent them just the panel of the embroidery, like that was, but it was on the velvet for the chair, this giant piece of velvet for this chair. <laughs> and they, I mean, I, I would have loved to have, you know, I always wish I saw people's reactions, right? I'd like to like to imagine that they were like, Oh my God, what is this woman doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> But it was a lot of fun, you know, so even things like that, you know, again, they push you to do something that maybe you wouldn't just do on your own in your living room, you know, pulling from all the requests and things that, you know, I tell all of my family, like, if you want something, you can ask, I mean, I don't promise to make it. And if I do make it, I don't promise to do it in a timely manner, but you can always ask because every now and again, I will, you know, do something. And of course we sent it back and now she has this, what I think is a really cool chair in her living room. <laughs> The chair back arrives. Oh. oh, just give her the certificate. <laughs> She's done. That's enough. <laughs> yeah. Like, we're done here. Whatever. No. And and that was that was one of the first times. That was before I did my applique project. But you know, it made me realize, like, all right, if I'm gonna do something big, right? Like you need you need a mix of techniques because otherwise you're gonna be at this, you know, for 20 years, which is not ideal. So um, you know, putting in the leather with the wool actually worked really well. And for that you know, we still have this great resource in the U.S. that is called the Garment District in New York, and they have leather places, you know, and you can buy lamb's wool that's actually quite, or not lamb's wool, uh, lamb skin that's quite thin. It's actually not hard to stitch through. And I think the place is called Global Leathers, but I go there in the Garment District, and they have a back wall of, like, stuff that they're just clearancing, and you can, I used to be able to buy the skins for like 20 bucks for the whole lamb skin, you know, on the clearance stuff, which is an amazing price. So when I go to New York, I always go there and I'm like, all right, what cool colors do you have? And I just, you know, I add to my stash so that I have, you know, these stitchable leathers, which then again are, you know, they're good for all kinds of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that thou that scene now I have to write that down now yeah. too. Yeah, I'm pretty I'm sure it's global York. letters. Yeah. And, and and you know, and they you just they're really nice. You know, they I'm sure they kind of don't haven't figured me out, but I've been in enough that I think sometimes they actually recognize me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if I had a cash register sound effect right now, I just insert it on this behalf <laughs> yes, here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's a deal. Come on, Gary, it's a deal. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you never know, you know. And 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 my little mind is spinning because I've got more projects in my head than I have ever written down. I think, oh, lambs wool. I wonder, I wonder how they dye it. I wonder if I could dye it myself. I wonder if we could. And so now you got my whole mind spinning in a different manner. Well, and I really love natural products, you know, so I, mm -hmm. I really only work with wool and silk and, you know, real metal and, you know, leather, you know, I just, I, you know, that's, you know, kind of the old way of things. And I don't know, I like natural things. <laughs> right. It, 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 there's something and it's how it feels in your hand too. Um, no. There's, there's the tactile thing for me. So, yeah. Oh, I, I definitely shot by touch. I mean, it's not awesome, you know, in general to touch things. <laughs> You're right. telling your kids, don't touch, don't touch. But of don't course touch. I have to touch everything I'm going to buy. But man, the lambskin is great because, you know, again, like you can make boxes with it, you know, I mean, you know, with the cardboard inserts, but it's stitchable. So, you know, you can now all of a sudden make an embroider, you know, embroider a top for a box and make the box basically leather. Right. I mean, there's, you know, so many interesting things finishing place, finishing things to do it. Or if you're doing Christmas ornaments, you know, you, you do this leather backing instead of, you know, doing two sides. Um, it's just a nice option. Um, I know, you know, my, my aunt and my, um, mom do some of the three dimensional, um, needlepoint Santas, you know, there's some really actually cute designs for stuff like that, you know, and like for the bottom, you know, it's, it's nice to have a little piece of leather. Right. Right. Just All right, we're gonna, we're gonna run out of time, and I got to learn about <laughs> the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. What, tell about that. Yes, yeah. So um, in New Hampshire, you know, it's, they really have pushed to try to sort of, you know, save artistry, and so they actually have in uh, Sunapee, they have a a big show every summer in August where all the craftsmen come out and show their wares and you can shop. I mean, it's amazing for anyone that, you know, wants to come here. That is the, definitely the, it's the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen Fair, but otherwise they have these juried shops 
in a lot of towns around here. So, you know, you have to be, there are some exceptions. I think there are some parts of Maine that they let you join because you're just so darn close. But, um, <laughs> you know, basically you have to be living in New Hampshire and you get, you know, you get juried in by a group of your peers, depending on, you know, whether or not they think you bring a good skill set. And they also have, you know, a big place in, um, Concord, the capital where they have a showroom. So sometimes they just do shows, which is a lot of fun because, you know, in the shops, obviously they have things that are set up that are more saleable, but sometimes at the big shows and also at that, you know, at, you know, when they, um, in Concord, they'll just put together exhibits of just amazing things to see. So you can really see like what, you know, what are the big things that these artists are doing? You know, the pieces that you're not going to just, you know, see sitting in a shop. And uh, I just, I love the community, right? And it's it's all kinds of art. So you actually see some amazing woodworkers. I would say it were some of the, some of the big techniques there, but it's just a community to kind of support everybody to sort of, you know, continue on with their art. And a lot of people use it to sell in the shops. I don't, a lot of what I make just takes too long and I have so many projects that I want to be doing and, you know, things for specific, I don't have a lot to sell. Um, but yeah, it's an amazing community and I think more states should do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why I was interested. It, it just got the impression it was uh, solely to promote art and craft and keep these old techniques going. Um, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's perfect for that. And I, you know, I would like to think that other states do it, but I'm not very familiar yeah, there there probably are, but um, this was that, that was interesting. But... Yeah, yeah. So when you when you do an exhibit like for for the league, is that um, what what happens with that in terms of of do you have enough things that you can just pull some things out and make an exhibit, or does that then inspire you to create something new? Yeah, so they they um, usually have a theme. They usually do give you a little bit of a heads up so you can put something specific. But they'll basically, what's fun about those exhibits is that they have all kinds of different artists, right? So they will, you know, it'll be a mixture of woodworking and embroidery and, you know, maybe some sewing, you know, all kinds of stuff, but all centered around a specific theme. So I usually pull something that I already have, you know, cause I only need, you know, you're allowed to put in multiple pieces, but usually, you know, you're not going to put in more than a couple. Um, and then they are, you know, you can put a price on them. They usually are, you know, or you can just say, Hey, look, this is not for sale. This is just to show. Yeah. Um, so sometimes if, if the theme really makes sense, I'll pull something that I'm not willing to sell, but I just want people to see, because for me, one of the goals is to inspire others. You know, I want people to ask the questions of how do I learn that? Right. You know, or right. where do right. I, you know, not, not that you're not you know, necessarily trying to make money, but at the end of the day, this only exists and continues on if people learn it. Right. Mm -hmm. So as a community, even if, you know, we're not necessarily teachers, we want to get the information out there. We want to excite other people because it's that much more that's going to be supported and made. Yeah, that's so true. Oh, I'll bet New England woodworking. I'll bet there's some amazing things in those exhibits. Oh. Well, and, well, and they, you know, you'll even see some like silversmiths and pewter workers. Oh I mean, you have a, you know, a lot, you know, just a lot of cool stuff. You're like, oh, people still do that, you know, stained glass. <laughs> um, and and that, so I love it. You know, it's exciting. It's, it's even if you're not, like I said, going to shop um, to go to their, you know, annual fair um, in Sunapee is just, you know, it's just incredible, right? Just to see what's available because people, the artists really do tend to bring things there that they're not going to let sit in the shop. Right. Cause you're not getting enough people through. Right. Um, and I, and I think that's where they probably, a lot of, a lot of the really amazing artists too are working off of commissions, you know, so they're building specific pieces for people, but you know, that's where you go to meet them and find, find them. Yeah. Ah, uh, cool stuff. All right, Kirsten, we got to stop. Uh, yes. I have a feeling. Thank you so much. I have a feeling there's another <laughs> hour of things we could talk about. But we, uh, yes, yeah, we need to stop. Well, here. Beth, I, I hope I got you started. <laughs> yes, I, I, you know, now looking at yours, I'm like, okay, this is this has got to be done. It's going to be uh, getting into the holiday season. I know I won't pull it out, but um, next January. year, yeah, January, yeah, yes. January, January start. I'm all right. 
Yeah, Kirsten, Great. you've done the damage. Congratulations. <laughs> yep. Thank you. <laughs> it was a pleasure talking to you. All right, really enjoyed it. Thanks for talking to us, and thanks to everyone for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.